Hello, this is Thursday, September 8th, 2016, and you're watching our weekly web push pack. This week we're recording the show a day early because of some events coming up this weekend, which we'll be discussing a little bit later on. I'm Jason Ross, I'm the host today, and I'm going to be joined on the show today by two guests, by Helga Zepp-LaRouche, joining us from Germany, and by Diane Sayre, joining us from the LaRouche Manhattan Project in the New York area. Over the past few weeks, the world has changed dramatically. In particular, there have been several major international conferences that represent a solidification of a new paradigm and a new outlook among nations in the world. These conferences have been the Eastern Economic Forum in Vladivostok, Russia, the G20 meeting, which concluded in Hangzhou, China, and then the ASEAN, uh, the Southeast Asian nations meeting with China, which then has been taking place in Laos. In all three of these conferences, in all three of these meetings, the issue on the table has been creating a specific outlook for economic development and cooperation. Not responding to crises, not the South China Sea, it's been a long-term outlook on what will the future be. I'd like to read a few quotes from uh, presentations made at these conferences. At the B20 meeting, the meeting of business leaders in advance of the G20 meeting in China, President Xi Jinping stated that people are the foundation of the economy. We have to be oriented to the needs of the people and raise their living standards and the quality of their lives. We will lift over 57 million people out of poverty, and poverty will be alleviated in all poor countries by 2020. This is a solemn promise to the Chinese people. I'm sorry, poor counties. We have lifted over 70% of the Chinese population out of poverty. We will make the pie bigger, and we will continue the global fight against poverty. At the G20 conference, which included a very beautiful opening ceremony featuring the work of Beethoven and Schiller with the Ode to Joy set to uh, music and, uh, you know, quite a spectacle, the leaders there came to a conclusion in their uh, final communique from the conference, which included, we can no longer rely on fiscal and monetary policy alone to deal with the crisis. We envision an all-dimensional, multi-tiered, wide-ranging approach to innovation, which is driven by innovation in science and technology and goes beyond it to cover development philosophy institutional mechanisms and business models so that the benefits of innovation will be shared by all. Meanwhile, at the G20 conference, the most Obama had to say to anybody was some blubbering about human rights and discussion of the TPP, which has absolutely no chance of possibly being passed through the Congress. It's dead. At the ASEAN meeting, uh, a opportunity in the mind of Obama, for example, to put the South China Sea arbitration ruling um, that was uh, against China. He wanted to put that on the agenda, make that an issue, and instead that was not part of the discussion at all. What was instead discussed was economic cooperation, the Maritime Silk Road, the Chinese One Belt One Road project, and as a matter of fact, on the Philippines in particular, which had launched this arbitration case against China regarding the South China Sea, the new president of the Philippines, Duterte, when he was asked about Obama's plans to lecture him about violations of human rights in the Philippines' war on drugs, President Duterte said, I am a president of a sovereign state and have long ceased, since, and have long <laughs> ceased to be a colony. I do not have any master except the Filipino people. Nobody but nobody. You must be respectful. Do not just throw questions. Putang Ina, which translates to son of a whore, I will swear at you in that forum, he said to Obama. I do not want to pick a quarrel with Obama, but I certainly would not appear. I don't kneel down to anybody except the Filipino people. So, in all of this, Obama has absolutely been the odd man out. He has nothing to offer the world. Forbes magazine has recognized this in its coverage, for example, where it states that while Obama's talking about human rights and the TPP that will never occur, China has been, quote, 
quickly building its regional credentials with a heavy focus on the economy of Southeast Asia. China's Belt and Road Initiative connecting Asia to Europe economically would let Beijing and parts of Southeast Asia build a major transportation network plus industrial cooperation projects. Beijing also happens to manage the China ASEAN Investment Cooperation Fund, which bank rolls growth-linked infrastructure, energy, and natural resource projects in Southeast Asia. So I think the, the contrast between Obama, who has nothing, with what China and Russia, the BRICS nations, very specifically China and Russia in particular, have been offering the world strategically and economically, the contrast couldn't be clearer. And with the meeting, with the, um, the participation of the G77 leader, as well in these conferences, the world as a whole is adopting these as policies. So let's bring on uh, Helga Tseplarouche now. Uh, Helga was a participant at the T20 meeting, which was a meeting of thinkers, a think tank 20 meeting held in China in preparation for the G20 Heads of State Summit, which just occurred. Helga, let me ask you about this. How, in your view, how has the world changed over the past couple of weeks with, with these events? Well, I think it is a change of world historical dimensions. Because what has occurred between the Vladivostok East uh, Economic Forum, the G20, and then the ASEAN conference is a tremendous change in terms of where is the power center of the world and the fact that, you know, let me just go through very quickly what, what the significance of each of these different conferences was. In Vladivostok, uh, you had the integration of the Eurasian Economic Union with the so-called Belt and Road Initiative of China. Now, that is very important because also Abe, Pres President uh, Abe of, uh, uh, of Japan and President Park, Minister President Abe of, of Japan and President Park of Korea participated and there were agreements of long investment, long-term investments, the development of the Far East of Russia, of Siberia, of huge energy investment and integration of all of these economies of Asia. Now this was followed then by the G20 summit, which I think um, was really an absolute breakthrough. I mean, first of all, China had put an enormous amount of effort into the preparation by convening many, many pre-conferences starting already a year ago on many, many levels, ministers, think tanks, institutions and organizations and the intention from China of China was to transform the G20 from a mechanism which only responds to crises like 2008, you know, the financial crash of Lehman, into an organization which would form an alliance of countries to form a global governance mechanism which, you know, is problem solving. And uh, Xi Jinping said repeatedly he wants to transform the G20 from a talk shop uh, into a, <clears throat> a, a group of nations which act together. And looking at it, you know, uh, this was accomplished in, in ways, uh, you know, the Western media are hysterically and desperately trying to, to belittle this outcome of the conference by saying, you know, there were all these issues, uh, but the only people who, who raised these so-called issues like South China Sea conflict and, uh, you know, the, the issue of the arbitration uh, court in Den, in Den Haag uh, and, and other divisive issues was, was really the West. Now, what happened is that the overwhelming number of nations are moving to adopt the Chinese model of economy. Uh, and, you know, they are very right to do so because, you know, China has proven an economic miracle of such dimensions. You know, Xi Jinping said uh, to transform a country of 1.4 billion people has never been uh, 
undertaken in history. And the fact that China could uplift 700 million people out of poverty into a very decent living standard is also unprecedented. And one of the outcomes uh, of the summit was uh, the adoption of a plan to eliminate poverty all over the world until 2020. That is in only four years from now. Now, China succeeded to put the Chinese economic model uh, as the attractive model for everybody to join in a win-win perspective on the agenda. And many countries must say, yeah, we can have the same economic development like China. That is much more favorable than to join the United States or NATO or the Europeans in you know, confrontation of a geopolitical nature. So naturally, uh, the success of this uh, summit is, is really uh, unbelievable. And it has changed the situation in the world, I think, for good. Because the unipolar world for sure does not exist anymore. As a matter of fact, as you mentioned, Forbes magazine and Time magazine, they had quite historical articles saying the Obama-Asia pivot policy has completely failed. Uh, this was the last opportunity to uh, woo, uh, to woo the, the countries of the region. But you know this completely failed. And the Asia pivot of Obama is completely dead. It, it failed. Uh, so you know the G77, uh, the non-aligned movement, uh, the ASEAN countries, they all are now moving in a completely different uh, direction. And especially the fact that South Korea and Japan participated with Russia and China in this Vladivostok conference, you know, moves that proves that these countries who are obviously, you know, allied with the United States, but they do not want the confrontation against Russia and China anymore. So this is extremely important and it it means Primarily, those countries of the world, which under the old regime of the World Bank, the IMF, the so-called Washington Consensus, the so-called Bretton Woods institutions, uh, they had no voice and that they now have a voice. I think it is really very important that China explicitly adopted developing nations and emerging economies uh, to be, first of all, they invited all of them, uh, or a very large representation of them, to participate in the G20. And uh, China expressed the absolute commitment that every fruit of technological innovation would be shared with these countries in order not to hold up their development. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a beautiful idea, which you know the first time was expressed by the German, uh, German thinker Nicholas of Kuhs in the 15th century, who already then had said that you know, science and technology are so important for the development of mankind that they should, every time there is a new invention, it should be put in an international pool, to use modern word, words to, to, to say it, and that every country should have then access to it not to be slowed down in the development. Now that means, it's an incredible change because it means that for the first time an idea uh, which was expressed by my husband, uh, Lyndon LaRouche, in 1975, uh, when he proposed uh, a plan to develop the third world and he called it the International Development Bank. Uh, this was the idea which he presented both in Bonn, in Germany at the time, and in Milan. And he, at that time, wanted to have a 400, uh, 400 billion technology transfer per year to the developing sector from the advanced countries in order to build up infrastructure, to build up industrialization and agriculture in the third world. Now, that was also exactly, or he gave a very concrete um, a form to a demand of the non-aligned movement, who in 1976 at the non-aligned movement in Colombo in Sri Lanka had adopted 
a resolution demanding a just new world economic order. And that non-aligned movement resolution uh, was exactly, or 90% of the words were those of the IDB. But you know, what happened at that time was that uh, all the countries, or the, the leaders of the countries who had taken uh, the initiative uh, to, to fight for this, like uh, Mrs. Gandhi from India, Mrs. Bandara Naiki from Sri Lanka, uh, Bhutto from Pakistan, all these leaders were either killed or destabilized, and this whole effort had a tremendous setback, and it did not function. Now, as you probably know, or some of our viewers may know, we have been fighting in the Nahush movement uh, ever since that time, and it's now 40 years. Uh, we have been fighting for the realization of the IDB, or an IDB-like development plan for the third world. But, you know, the World Bank and the IMF all these years had done the exact opposite. Uh, the IMF conditionalities would completely deny any kind of development by you know, having conditions which would force developing countries to pay debt instead of uh, investing in infrastructure. Uh, they created a debt trap even to make it impossible for countries uh, to develop. So the miserable condition of, of Africa and many other countries, for example, in Asia, in the Middle East, some countries in South America, is the result of a conscious policy to suppress development. Mm. Now, after the Asia crisis, uh, you know, the Asian countries obviously realized that they had to do something to protect themselves against speculation of George Soros at the time. So a process of creating new institutions developed. Uh, one was the Chiang Mai initi initiative, but then uh, recently, about three years ago, China took the leadership together with other BRICS countries to create a completely alternative set of banking institutions. The Asian Investment Bank, uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, the New Development Bank of the BRICS, the new Silk Road Fund, the Maritime Silk Road Fund, the Shanghai Corporation Organization Bank. So you have now a completely alternate system of banking which is not casino, but only gives credit for real investment in infrastructure, in, in, in uh, you know, the real economy. So what is happening now, and I think people have to appreciate that, that what happened at the G20 meeting is the victory of the struggle of 40 years at least uh, to, make, uh, to make it possible for human beings in Africa, in the so-called developing sector, uh, to have a chance for the future. And such, such a powerful coalition has now emerged, the strategic alliance between China and Russia, Putin, uh, was uh, the guest of honor at this uh, G20 meeting. Uh, so the world really has changed, and you know it's very important to say that these articles in Forbes magazine and Time magazine really don't get it, because it's not anti-American, it's not anti-European, because Xi Jinping and the other leaders have expressed many times they want the United States and Europe to join in a win-win perspective. So what is on the table now with the G20 meeting uh, is for the first time a strategic initiative which is not geopolitical because it offers a level of reason to cooperate internationally for the common aims of mankind. And I think this is a tremendous historical breakthrough which we really must make sure that the American people find out about it, what it is and not be misled by a mediocre journalists who just can't think differently than geopolitics. You know, it's like uh, somebody uh, who is evil cannot imagine when he talks to a really good person that the other person is not also evil. So what you read in the in the Western media is just the projection of the degenerate thinking of the media, but it's not what happened at this summit. So let's make sure people really understand the historic significance of this change. Great. I think 
what you went through in terms of the history of your involvement of your husband, Lyndon LaRouche's involvement of the LaRouche movement's involvement over the past four decades in creating the victory for the policy that's being announced at these conferences really goes to show the power, the power of an idea that over cynicism or over what seem to be the structures and control of things, a good idea and successful and intense and ongoing organizing for it really can make things happen. Could you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask if you wanted to say more about uh, the history of, of the LaRouche movement's involvement in this, or also if you have anything to say about how we're going to get the U.S. to join on this development instead of being opposed to it. Well, first of all, I would like to just make a short comment on the ASEAN conference uh, because that was, you know, on the uh, on the footsteps of, or, you know, following the G20 meeting, and that dispute is now settled because the ASEAN countries, together with China, all agreed that all the disputes will be solved through peaceful negotiation and dialogue. They will work out a code of conduct until the middle of next year to this effect and jointly uh, fight uh, threats to security like terrorism and other threats. Uh, they will implement or act on the basis of the UN uh, <coughs> law, uh, law on the sea, the UNCLOS law, uh, and that means you know, all these efforts to hype up uh, the conflict between the Philippines and China with the Den Haag Arbitration Court uh, has, not, has not succeeded. This was an effort to cause disunity, but this ASEAN conference said, no, we want to have joint economic development, we will revive a regional economic development uh, organization. Uh, so I think you know, it shows that the foreign policy of China, not only at the G20, was changing uh, the agenda completely, but also in terms of regional conflict, that if you have a win-win perspective, where you take into, in, into account the interest of the other, you can find solutions. So, you know, then what is left for Obama, uh, the only option some papers were writing is the implementation of TPP, but as you already mentioned, uh, both houses, the House and the Senate and the two candidates for president, all have said uh, TPP is out. Uh, the spokes speakers of the two houses have said it will not get uh, on the agenda this year, which means not during the time of Obama. So TPP is that TT. IP, that's the European version of the same thing, is also dead. So I think that you know the world really has changed. Unipolar demands and the you know the idea that you can decide rules uh, on behalf of one country is no longer in existence, and we have entered a completely new era of respect for the sovereignty of the other country and an alliance of essentially republics for a greater good. And this is obviously a, a really important development. Not only does it mean that the United States has the chance to go back to the foreign policy of John Quincy Adams, because that is exactly what he had outlined for the United States to do, but it also means that the kind of uh, <clears throat> system of perfectly sovereign, sovereign nation states uh, working together for joint development, what we have pushed, uh, especially naturally Mr. LaRouche has pushed for over 50 years, uh, this is now becoming a reality. So, you know, I think that we can be very happy about that because the LaRouche movement uh, for the last 40 years, uh, but especially the last 25 years, convened literally hundreds of conferences around the world in every major U.S. and European city, in Rio de Janeiro, in Sao Paulo, Brasilia, Mexico, uh, Beijing, New Delhi, Moscow, many even in Australia, in Egypt, uh, in other African countries. We had seminars, conferences, and I think we have now a Renaissance movement and a world movement for development. 
And since you mentioned the beautiful gala concert which preceded the G20, this was, you know, in some sense, similar to what we are doing with the dialogue of classical culture, because it started with a very, very beautiful, um, you know, series of Chinese folk songs. Uh, then it had uh, the <coughs> scenes of a ballet of the, the Swan Lake uh, dance in a lake. So, you know, the dancers would make sort of little fountains by each step because they would step into the water and it gave it an unbelievable effect. And naturally, you know, the fact that they choose the Ode to Joy, um, the beautiful poem by Schiller composed by Beethoven, um, where the text is, you know, at one point it says, all men become brethren, alle Menschen werden Brüder which is the poetical expression of the win-win perspective that, you know, there is a higher goal of mankind, you know, and they, they choose that to, to sort of be the high point of the gala, you know, really shows, uh, shows you know, that, that they have understood something very, very fundamental and, you know, they said the text written by Friedrich Schiller, so naturally many people will have thought about the Schiller Institute and, you know, we have used the Ode to Joy uh, many times to express the same idea. So I think that we can be really proud because we, you know, we did not do everything, but we had a very good part in producing this beautiful result. Wonderful. Well, let me, I'd like to switch now. I'd like to return to get more thoughts from you, but I'd like to bring in Diane Sayre at this point to discuss one of the options, one of the opportunities for changing the United States, which is that this weekend, this uh, Sunday, is the 15th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks from 2001. And the man who is the uh, head of the, the founding man and managing director of the Schiller Institute New York City Community Chorus, as well as a member of the LaRouche Pack Policy Committee, uh, she has been very engaged in a process around what Mr. LaRouche has called a living memorial for 9-11, which is a series of concerts that are taking place this weekend. I'd like to ask Diane about that and first mention something about the context, which is that over the past month, we've had the release of the 28 pages, the 28 classified pages of the Congressional Joint Inquiry into the uh, into 9-11. And we've got scheduled for a vote tomorrow, the JASTA bill, the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, which would make it possible for the family members, for victims of 9-11, Saudi Arabia directly in U.S. courts for having aided in the commission of an attack on U.S. soil. This has the potential to really transform 9-11 from an opportunity for those pushing a policy of conflict and war to really get justice on this by redefining American strategic policy. But let me let me ask you, Diane, um, what's you've been very involved in this, of course. Could you talk to us about the conception of a living memorial? What, what's what's happening this weekend? How are we putting that into practice? Well, I I'll take uh, to situate it in a question you asked earlier of. Uh, Helga, the question is how can the U.S. join this new paradigm? What is holding us back? And one very important aspect is not simply the idea of a unipolar world, but a unipolar world which is based on fantasy and lies and delusion. Uh, which we have seen in particular, I wouldn't say it began with the terror attacks of September 11th, 2001. But uh, after that, what did you have? Since the truth was not told, and you referenced the 28 pages being released and the potential for, for JASTA to be passed this, this week, what happened? We had an attack which was... And, um, sorry, by the, and instead we invaded Iraq and then we invaded Libya 
And now we have an insane President Obama who wants to overthrow Assad. Uh, we have let our actions, the actions of the United States on behalf of this British Saudi empire have explicitly created an increase in terror attacks around the world, an increase in war, an increase in the death rate, and uh, I was reading this morning that they're saying as many as 400,000 people in the New York metropolitan area have been affected by the attack on the World Trade Center because of all of the toxic debris that flew mm -hmm. into the air that you have over, I think, 1,100 people who have contracted rare forms of terminal cancer. Uh, we run into them all the time here in New Jersey, people who were first responders, who were security, who were police, who worked in the area. So you've had a great injustice. And because the injustice has been allowed to continue, the crime has only grown in magnitude so that the number of people who have died as a result of this has been expanding. What potential to, uh, to remedy that situation, to, to bring justice, which would in a sense clear the conscience of the American people to make us morally capable and morally fit of joining with the rest of the world in this new paradigm. And what Mr. LaRouche said explicitly when the question came up at one of the Saturday town hall meetings on the idea of what can we do for these people who died on September 11th, and he said a living memorial. And so when I think of living memorial, I think about Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg and his words that the dead have already consecrated this ground, but it is up, it's up to us, the living, to make sure that they have not died in vain. Therefore, what we are seeking to do here, by doing something which is a completely beautiful thing and noble is to enable the American people to actually address this and to uh, to insist that our nation becomes something different than what it was. And it is not a coincidence that this is occurring at the same time that we have these extraordinary breakthroughs. Right now, though, for the... Um over the, if you could say more, over the weekend, I know that we've got uh, a, your the Schiller Institute Chorus is going to be participating in a series of concerts of the Mozart Requiem, of spirituals, of other pieces uh, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Could you tell us how the participation in these kinds of events shows a potential to to change people? Uh, what kind of responses have you been getting from musicians, from politicians from others involved in these events. What what significance does this show you at having already? Well, I think perhaps the most exciting thing that's occurred is the growth of the chorus. Because the people who participate in the chorus are the ones, in a sense, who will be the most transformed by these events. Uh, the, we began the chorus almost two years ago in December of 2014 in the wake of the choking death, a, a, an African-American man was strangled by the police in Staten Island and the grand jury determined there was no wrongdoing on the part of the police. And there was a great deal of anger um, which was threatening to rip apart the city. And we said, well, why not, why not do something beautiful dedicated to the sanctity of human life or the question of the brotherhood of, of man? Let's not let ourselves be divided. Let's not have fits of rage and um, police officers who also have been put in a bind because they're trying to protect 
our cities, our poorest populations, which have been destroyed and and um, and made insane by the drug epidemic, which is funded and run out of Wall Street. So what occurred is we had about 100 people show up to sing. One of them suggested that we form a community chorus, which I did. And we went from week upon week where we had three people, five people, 12 people, finally a, a core of about 40. I can say at the, um, the performance of the Mozart Requiem that we will be doing in Manhattan on Saturday, uh, there will be about 160 people in this chorus. And, uh, and they are themselves telling others they're profoundly affected. We know that members of the fire department in Brooklyn, uh, the brigade where every single one of them was killed on September 11th, uh, they hold a, a special mass every year this year, our chorus is going to be involved in, in singing the Mozart Requiem as part of the mass. And members of the fire department there were very moved that someone had thought to do something on this level to honor those people who made the ultimate sacrifice in the aftermath of that. So it's opening up and um, inspiring many people instead of just saying, well, we're going to swallow or we're going to take it. We're not going to talk about this. We're going to act like nothing happened and we're going to presume we can never get justice. There's a sense now that no, we don't have to go along with this anymore. We can get justice. And I would just say that my point earlier that in this way, the United States could be transformed to make it possible that we would no longer act as a uh, cat's paw for the British Empire, but be capable of joining with China and Russia. And I'll further say that the beauty of this potential development has absolutely nothing to do with the stupid elections and the idiotic candidates that we have, but is from a much higher standpoint. Good. Well, D Diane, did you have anything else you'd like to say on that topic, or I'd like to... Uh, ask um, ask Helga a question. Do you have anything else, Diane? Go ahead. That's fine. Okay. Well, I wanted to to ask Helga um, with the potential. Let let's let's paint for our viewers an idea of a future, if we could. You know, with the U.S. dropping this zero sum game geopolitical approach, um, with the U.S. and and Europe adopting the proposals that you're putting forward, what what could the world be like in five or 10 years? I mean, is this a, an endless, you know, perpetual fight or, or what, what does victory look like? What could the world be like? Well, I think um, things can change very quickly. Uh, if the United States and Europe would adopt the class legal banking separation law, which is, as you know, in bills in the Congress, in the Senate, and I was quite um, happily, um, you know, reacting when I saw that Black Lives Matter is now de uh, demanding from Hillary Clinton uh, <clears throat> that she should adopt class legal because, you know, you can only fight racism if you fight the injustice uh, caused by Wall Street. I thought this was an uh, irony. Um, so if the United States and Europe, which is bankrupt, I mean, let me just spend one sentence on that, you know. Um, I mean, China has growth rates, you know, anywhere 6.7%, they want to have now 7% again. India had even 8% growth rates. Other Asian countries are going in the same direction. And what is the growth rate in Europe? Uh, the new statistics of the Eurozone just came out 0.3%. Uh, and France, Italy, and Finland, 0%. Then naturally, all the parameters, uh, you know, are really alarmist. Uh, <clears throat> the headlines today are Draghi, the head of the European Central Bank, has no more options. 
he's running out of options because negative interest rate, uh, <coughs> quantitative easing, uh, <coughs> helicopter money, all of these are signs of a dying system. And then naturally you have Deutsche Bank, which is uh, having all the parameters like Lehman Brothers in 2008. Uh, you know, the uh, credit, uh, credit default swap uh, costs are now exactly like for Lehman Brothers uh, just before it blew up. And if that happens, you could have the next 2008 crisis this September or October. So the fight for Klaus Siegel is super urgent. And naturally, as uh, Lyndon LaRouche has stressed very emphatically with his four laws, this is not enough, then you need to have a credit system and you need to issue credit for real investment. Now, if these changes can be done quickly this year, even before the US election occurs, then you know there is no reason why the world cannot enter a completely new paradigm, stop geopolitical confrontation. Um, you know, it's the, the danger of war is not yet eliminated. I, I don't want to make a false uh, security when it's not there, but with the new alliance between Russia, Turkey, Iran, the Syria question can, can be solved. With the uh, 28 pages and the Jaxta bill, you know, maybe the Saudi support for terrorism can also be brought to an end. And then, you know, even the German economic development minister uh, from the CSU, the Christian uh, Social Union, uh, made a speech yesterday in the parliament demanding a Marshall Plan for Africa. He said, uh, this present global system uh, is a failure. It has created forms of early capitalism in many parts of the world. This cannot continue. Uh, in the next uh, <clears throat> 30 years, 2 billion babies will be born alone in Africa. They need many jobs, many teachers, real investment. Uh, he demanded that the WTO be transformed from a fair trade into uh, from a free trade into a fair trade mechanism. So this is a conservative politician from Germany of the Merkel government, and he's the only one who, who so far had the courage and the vision to, to say these things. But that's actually true. With the new alliance I described earlier in the context of the G20, now Japan is starting to invest massively in Africa. And this was welcomed by China. China said we are not in Africa for competitive reasons, but the need for development is so big, we are happy if India, Japan uh, are all uh, <clears throat> investing. And naturally, you know, Europe should invest. The United States should help to overcome the poverty uh, and build up the Middle East, you know, rebuild the war-torn region, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Syria, Yemen, Libya, all of Africa. If all of these countries would be developed with the extension of the new Silk Road, uh, POCOM, and all countries would work together, you know, poverty could be eliminated in a very short period of time. Maybe in a couple of years, two years, uh, Gerd Müller, the development minister, pointed out to the fact that 80% of Africans still do not have electricity access. Now that could be very, very quickly uh, changed. Uh, we have developed in our program of the World Land Bridge a comprehensive development plan for Africa, infrastructure, bridges, ports, fast train systems, roads, uh, the development of <coughs> agriculture and industry, the creation of large amounts of fresh water to fight the desert, uh, you know, through peaceful nuclear energy, desalinization of ocean water, the ionization of moisture in the atmosphere. In a few years, Africa and those parts of the world which are still in poverty could look like beautiful gardens, forests, agriculture, new cities, People studying, uh, you know, to become scientists, to become musicians, to become artists. I mean, the human potential for creativity has just been, you know, scratched on. You know, we had so far we had only outstanding geniuses like once a century. You know, you had Plato, 
äh, Cusanus, Kepler, Leibniz, äh, Beethoven, Einstein, a couple of more people I'm not naming here. And you know, these were relatively rare uh, phenomena. If we go in the road now on the horizon, and every child on this planet can have access to universal education, uh, you know, because there's enough to eat, there's enough housing so that the child can study uh, and is not distracted by <coughs> poverty or by Pokemon Go or some other <laughs> idiotic thing. Uh, but the child can learn classical music, uh, bel canto singing, learn geography, learn uh, astronomy, learn uh, <coughs> the history of the universe, the history of mankind, universal culture, love other cultures by, by knowing the beauty of Chinese painting, of Indian uh, drama, of poetry from Persia. Once you know these cultures, you, you cannot help but saying, look, this is such an enrichment. All racism would go, all xenophobia would go, and the world community would just be working together for the common aims of mankind, developing, you know, breakthroughs like thermonuclear fusion power in the short term, space colonization in the medium term, um, short and medium term, and discover new breakthroughs we have not even an inkling of to ask the right question. We are not an earthbound system, by no means. The ecologists are always talking about finding solutions within earthbound systems. This is complete nonsense. The, uni the human being, uh, the mankind, is a species which naturally can develop the continent uh, and the planet with infrastructure and open up landlocked areas on Earth. But the continuation of this infrastructure will be in closed space, the moon being a first target. You know, other, uh, other objects, asteroids, will be studied. Eventually, we will have the means to, to take longer uh, space flights to Mars and, and other uh, other bodies in, in, the, in, in space, and we will become a human species where the beautiful idea of Vladimir Vernadsky that the noosphere will take over the biosphere more and more. What he meant by that is that human discoveries, human scientific and technological innovation will be what will rule and what dominates the world more and more. And from that standpoint, the fact that China decided to put the innovation in the center of their efforts is really the right step in the right direction. So I can see, and I hope to see this in my lifetime, that you know the <clears throat> relations among nations will completely change. That you no longer are looking, you know, full of mistrust and xenophobia against everything which is foreign but that people will become much more educated, there will be much more patriots and citizens of the world, world citizens, which must not be a contradiction. This was said by Friedrich Schiller 200 years ago. Uh, and that we will basically give up all those stupid habits which prevent our creative potential from unfolding. And people will have intelligent discussions, they will have loving relations among themselves by furthering the interest of the other. So I think we are at the verge of you know, becoming adult. I think right now the human race behaves like little uneducated, spoiled two-year-olds who kick against the knee of your colleague you know, and they scream and say, this is my toy and you know, that's about the mental level of geopolitics. And I think that that is not worthy of, of man. I think man is, is uh, meant to be a creative species fully loving each other and you know therefore the ode to joy what was played at the gala uh, evening in, in, in Hanzhou is really the the, uh, the vision of the future. Wonderful. I, I just want to add one thing on that which is that you know you'd mentioned how China had put technology as a major factor in in their outlook on things and when that's coming from china it really means something 
I mean, China is the nation that's gone and had a landing on the moon for the first time in decades. It's China that in two years plans to have the first ever landing on the far side of the moon. And it's China, which in that process is offering for international use uh, the use of a communications relay satellite that they'll have with the moon that they plan to make available to other nations who want to do work there. You know, that, their fusion program, it really shows the potential on the highest level of economy, which is what your husband has you know, pointed out for decades, that infrastructure provides a platform for the meeting of the needs, the productive needs of society. As you said, children being able to have you know, enough food to be able to concentrate on education, on learning about the great cultures of the world, of their, their past cultures, to be able to contribute to it in the future, that, you know, we're not a, uh, you know, be citizens of the world, we can be citizens of the solar system, and we've really got a very broad potential outlook for ourselves, and that on that highest level, it's driving mankind as the species forward, which we can do through collaboration on science, that really you know, really lets us collaborate on the highest possible level. Um, let me let me ask, do you have any, uh, are there any final words from either of you? Would you like to, do you have any concluding remarks? Yeah, I would like people to, I'm aware of the fact that what I'm saying is not the mainstream opinion about China, about all these countries. And I would ask the, you know, the audience, to not just dismiss uh, if you disagree with what I said, but please take the effort to look into it yourself. Uh, look at the speeches of uh, Xi Jinping and the other leaders. Look at what China is doing. Study Confucius. Uh, and you will find out that there is indeed a completely different philosophy. And that philosophy is much, much closer to what the United States was when it was founded than most people would imagine, both in terms of economics, but also in terms of, you know, that the government should be there for the common good. Now, this is an idea which almost has been lost uh, in, in the last uh, decades. But, you know, I think people should just not dismiss it. Once you are convinced of what, what I have said is true, help us to get the United States on board the United States needs a Silk Road. Uh, China has a plan to have 50,000 kilometers of fast train system by 2020. And, you know, we have developed an extension of the Silk Road for the United States, also having a huge system of fast trains connecting the East and the West Coast, the North and the South, build a couple of new cities in, you know, places in the United States, which uh, makes sense. And, you know, there is no cannot be part of this. And, you know, it's not anti-American. America should become part of it, and you should help to do this. Mm. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much both for joining us, and thank you to our viewers for joining us. If you're in the New York area, definitely become involved in this process over the weekend. You can find out more at the Schiller Institute New York City Chorus website. And stay tuned to LaRouche Pack. Subscribe so you don't miss our shows. And we'll see you next time.